we buy locally produced food for lots of reasons. Local food can be fresher, healthier, tastier. Buying directly from producers can develop trust between farmers and consumers. Farmers markets and other local food outlets can help educators promote mindful eating and build community. And sometimes we just want to know that the chicken we're about to eat had plenty of space and lots of friends. And then there are food miles. We're all familiar with this concept that locally produced food has to, has to travel less distance to reach us. And so we reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the fossil fuels used for transportation. Locally produced food, smaller carbon footprint. Food print, if you will. It's an attractive logic, and I frequently hear students in my food systems classes argue that to reduce our food prints, we should all be buying more food that is produced nearer to us. But the food miles concept is flawed. When we look more closely at the evidence, we discover that it's extremely unlikely that buying food produced nearer to us will reduce emissions. Here's why. Greenhouse gases are generated at every stage in a food's life cycle. From transportation, yes, but also from the inputs of seeds, fertilizers, and pesticides. From on-farm production practices like clearing land, plowing, irrigation, and harvesting. From processing and packaging, and from refrigeration and storage. And only about 4% of these total cradle-to-grave life cycle emissions come from moving food from the producer to the retailer. And that's the only part of the whole supply chain that is affected by locally produced food. In contrast, about 80% of emissions come from the on-farm production stage. Nonetheless, 4% of all food system emissions is a lot of carbon when scaled up over a person's lifetime or over a society. So wouldn't it be worth reducing those by buying local food? Well, yes, of course, all else being equal. But the majority of the time, all else is not equal. If producing food locally means producing it in places where climate and soil are anything other than optimal, then production quickly becomes less efficient and more greenhouse gas emissions will be generated in compensating for that inefficiency than, by reducing, than will be saved by reducing transportation. Let me give you a couple of examples, both from studies conducted in the UK. Tomatoes are grown in the UK, but for much of the year, doing so requires heated greenhouses. That's because the climate there is not sufficiently warm or sunny. England is not a sunny place. Trust me, I grew up there. <laughs> and so, for a consumer buying tomatoes in the UK, the emissions produced by domestically produced tomatoes can be up to four times higher than for sun-grown tomatoes imported from Spain. Second example. Producing lamb in New Zealand on pasture and shipping it all the way around the world to the UK can generate far higher emissions, <laughs> far fewer emissions, than lamb that is produced in the UK that requires supplemental animal feed. And these examples are more the norm than the exception. For most food products, a small handful of regions will have optimal growing conditions and will therefore have a comparative advantage in production efficiency. It's possible to grow avocados in Colorado. It's much more emissions efficient to grow them in California and then transport them. And these Geographic comparative advantages help explain why the food miles concept doesn't stand up to scrutiny. A second part of this is that how far food is moved matters much less than by the mode of transport by which it's moved. Most commercial food transportation is by relatively high efficiency vehicles. Thousands of units of food can be shipped by a single truck or ship. Consequently, the emissions per unit food can be very small. In contrast, our personal vehicles are incredibly inefficient. If thousands of us drive even a mile or two to pick up a small amount of food, the emissions per unit food that we generate 
maybe much higher. So maybe CSA and grocery store delivery services have something to offer in this regard. This is not an attack on local food. There's undoubtedly enormous value in developing relationships with the amazing farmers that produce our food, and in knowing that Colin the chicken led a good life. So let's continue buying some of our food locally for that and other reasons. But let's not fool ourselves that simply reducing the distance between producers and retailers is an effective way of, of doing our bit to mitigate climate change. But then, if we want to fight climate change, if we think that individual behavioral changes are part of the solution, and if we want to address our emissions from our food choices in particular, are there choices we can make that would help? Absolutely. The data consistently show that dramatically reducing or eliminating our consumption of animal products would vastly reduce emissions from the food system. Compared side by side, all animal products generate higher emissions per kilogram of product than do plant proteins. But not all animal products are equal, or as on George Orwell's farm, some animal products are more equal than others. <laughs> and specifically, from an emissions perspective, cattle and sheep products are much worse than other animal pro products. And that's because cows and sheep are ruminants. Their digestive systems generate enormous volumes of methane in a process called enteric fermentation. Put more simply, cow burps are really bad for the climate. And so, perhaps surprisingly, this and other meta-analyses of multiple independent life cycle analyses show that the production of extensively grazed, grass-fed beef can generate much higher emissions than intensively raised feedlot beef. And that's for at least two reasons. First, grass-fed cows take longer to reach slaughter weight, so they're alive for longer and belch out more methane. Second, grass-fed systems require much more space. In many parts of the world, this means clearing natural vegetation to create pasture land. In the Brazilian Amazon, where I do most of my research, the creation of cattle pasture is the leading cause of deforestation. Chopping down forests releases vast quantities of carbon dioxide. It also removes habitats that are critical for other species to survive. So, you may not be concerned about climate change, or you may be concerned but think that food choices are not the way that you want to address your personal carbon footprint. And there may be some rationale in that. A recent study suggested that the individual actions that are most likely to have the greatest impact on climate change mitigation are having one less child, flying less, and making greener personal vehicle choices. But eating a plant-based diet is next on that list. And there's a critical distinction between some of these behaviors. We will all, at most, only ever make a handful of decisions about how many children to have, and decisions about what car to drive maybe every decade or so. In contrast, we make food choices every single day. Adopting a more plant-based diet, or at very least, one that dramatically cuts back on cow and sheep products, including both meat and dairy, is probably the single biggest immediate action that most of us can take to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We all have the opportunity to walk out of here tonight and choose to reduce our carbon footprint.